Hello everybody, Richard Dolan here for QuestCap and all things MedQuest TV. We're so delighted to have the, the one, the only uh, Michael McCarthy, who's not only an advisor to the board, but has also been an instrumental player in uh, being both a pioneer and in the process of uh, really, in fact, equipping levels of government, uh, communities alike, uh, and even advising government uh, regulators and uh, investigators on how to get the upper hand the moment that a, an epidemic or a pandemic for that matter ever strikes. So Michael, a real pleasure to not only be working with you, but to have you right here right now. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure being on here right now. And it is great to be advising QuestCap who are taking the leadership role for uh, entrepreneurship to do what's necessary to help us all get through this and come out the other side uh, intact. Yeah, well, and listen, by the way, I know, I know that all the things that they're doing, they, they truly are at the forefront of actually leading the charge, making donations, making pledges, uh, launching investigations, uh, meeting with researchers and professors and thought leaders just like yourself, as well as uh, immunologists and scientists trying to codify things. But tell me from your perspective, given your incredible tenure, your background, your history, and your track record, what, what's particularly special about what QuestCap's doing right now with the current state of affairs from, from your perspective? I think uh, unlike governments who are weeks behind in trying to catch up with the virus, QuestCap is looking to the future on how to deal with the virus in real time, how to put things in place so governments and societies at large, both private and public, can make decisions that will allow them, A, to get back to work, protect their employees, protect their loved ones. That's what what I really like about it is the nimbleness of their ability to identify opportunities to support uh, effective decisions that will equate to getting over this uh, once in a lifetime uh, outbreak. Well, you're, and, you're no stranger to uh, nimbleness. I mean, you, you've been a champion for the ultimate pivot. You've been uh, instrumental in, in helping the Ontario government and thus then and by de facto uh, all levels of government really respond the minute crisis strikes in the form of uh, a virus infection and disease. Uh, tell me, how impressed are you or not, uh, given the speed and the rate of uh, attention that let's just say the collective governments uh, of our country here in Canada has been really paying to uh, the current state of affairs for all things COVID-19? Well, I think they've communicated uh, a sense of leadership a lot better than uh, what we experienced when SARS hit uh, Canada in 2003. But at the same time, in 2003, when SARS hit, there was no test. We had no ability to really understand what the virus was at the time it was starting to express itself at emergency rooms in Ontario. And so we were flying and putting the airplane together at the same time uh, back in the day. So there was a lot of lessons learned that we would have thought by now that would have been implemented and followed to make this outbreak a lot easier to handle. And my concern is we had a two month runway of watching what happened in Asia and China related to their outbreak and how they handled it and we did a lot of watching and a lot a lot of action and now we're playing catch up and the virus is ahead of us and so if we're going to wait for government to solve this problem we're in deep deep trouble it's they know two speeds slow and slower it's the private sector that i think is going to save the day here and they're the ones that are going to find the tools to provide society with the uh, instruments to combat COVID-19, whether it's rapid testing, whether it's research, whether it's uh, ingenuity, uh, when it's related to doing things differently and mass communicating with the public. I, I think that, uh, thank goodness we have the private sector helping out this time. No offense to our governments, but they're, they're playing catch up. Completely agree, completely agree. And when we look south of the border, I mean, uh, any disaster, even a natural disaster, we, we need not go with that back uh, too far in the history books to see that uh, when hurricanes struck, uh, let's say, you know, whether it was the Carolinas or, or New Orleans, uh, as just some example, uh, it was private enterprise. Uh, it was small and medium-sized business. It was corporate America that actually responded far faster and more superior to that of uh, government level, uh, federal level response uh, times. Uh, do you have an opinion about just how uh, the U.S. governments are really, in fact, handling the crisis at hand from your perspective? Well, it's not coordinated from my uh, my view of it. Uh, you have each state doing their own thing. There really should be one 
one voice that speaks for all. It's, uh, the virus knows no borders. I think the lockdown, the quarantine that's taking place is uh, is not uh, uniform across the board. And so it's, it's like playing whack-a-mole with that kind of a model where the fire's put out one place and it shows up in another. So there isn't the coordination that I would hope to see in the greatest country on the planet that they have all these tools at their disposal to combat this. So it is my hope that the private sector continues to put their hand up to say, we're, we can do this. The, the, the American uh, mindset is that it, 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 it can make it happen if it truly gets itself together to make this a reality. And so it's gonna need a, a, a more of a uniform voice uh, across the United States to do that. And I think that is coalescing now once it's unfortunate that we are seeing uh, many people ill, uh, health systems being overrun in the United States in terms of uh, access to, to equipment and uh, personal protection equipment for uh, doctors and nurses and other frontline uh, uh, providers. Um, this is a challenge. I would have thought that the United States would have had uh, testing in hand, all that equipment in hand in advance of this, and, and for it to uh, uh, be scrambling now is a big concern, and, and I'm just hoping that the private sector can pick up the pieces. Well, speaking of pieces, I mean, you're talking about a whole different reality. And, and from my perspective, as many conversations as I've been able to have uh, afforded by QuestCap, I mean, I've been able to talk to so many people about this new reality, and it's, it's been cited that uh, when we get back to business, it won't be business as usual, but business as unusual as it's going to ever get. Uh, but the census is that we're going to have a new reality of uh, consistent and constant self-testing and self-assessing so that we can self-regulate. Uh, I got a clear bill of health. I can get back to school, get back to work, or get back to what I'm doing. Or, gosh, I don't. Let me self-quarantine. Do you see this being true, Michael? Do you see that uh, as we head into the future, this is not going to be one of those cyclical things where it dissipates, uh, we've got a control on this, uh, et cetera, but, but, but testing and self-assessing and then self-governing is going to be the new norm, the new standard of existence? What's your thoughts? Well, my thought is that this is the new normal that we're headed into, and the reality is COVID-19 is going to be around for quite a while. We don't have any science that would suggest it's going to be cyclic and seasonal. Uh, it's already exploding in Africa, so the idea that warm weather would uh, dissipate the virus is, uh, turns out to be not true. So the new normal to me looks like if we want to return to some kind of economy that's sustainable and, and allows us to uh, have the resources to not only deal with COVID-19, but everything else in modern society that we're going to have to have like a COVID-19 standard, a gold standard of testing, 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 in order for people to reintegrate into society, at least in the short term, so that we can build that community immunity that's going to be necessary while we wait for a vaccine development that could be at least a year away. A, and to manufacture it for the world will take and to give it to people will take years. So COVID-19 is going to be around for a long time. So I see if you have, if the economy wants to resume, people are going to have to be able to identify that they're COVID-19 free. They have antibodies to it. They'll be allowed to work. It will not be business as usual in places like travel, sports, entertainment, restaurants, things like that. There will have to be a, a, a consistent filter to ensure that people that want to go to those things will not be put in harm's way in the future. We cannot continually have an up and down quarantine type of society where you stop schools and the economy every three or four months as an outbreak uh, reemerges. So testing will be the immediate answer. After this first wave, and this make no mistake about the, the efforts to save everybody in this first wave to ensure that the health system can respond to the wave, the first, the big peak where the surge comes in and, uh, and, and the health system can't contain uh, the amount of people that are walking through its doors. So this uh, quarantine that's taking place now is necessary to set the stage for the health system to be prepared for what the new normal will be in the next couple of years. As the economy resumes, uh, the most vulnerable and seniors will continue have to be sequestered with self uh, um, isolation models 
uh, until a vaccine comes around, those that have cleared the virus will be the first to resume in the economy. They will have to be tested. They will be uh, mostly uh, focus on essential services at the beginning, but as more people can prove that they're either COVID free or they got immunity to it through testing, they'll be able to start to ramp up the uh, economy again to make it sustainable so that we can afford all the stuff we're trying to do to help people stay alive. So this is, people have to realize that many things are not gonna ever return. The grand experiment of people working at home and, and online versus uh, office towers and big centers. I think uh, the the day of office towers full of cubicles of people is over. The new world is online for white collar workers to a large degree. This is the grand experiment of our time that's taking place before our eyes. And I think that will be a big finding as we return to normal that a lot of people can be productive and work from home. And the, those that have to go out and provide the widgets and the food and the services necessary to keep society together, they will have to be able to produce a COVID-19 certificate on their phone, so something that will identify them as the person that is COVID free because we cannot uh, put the kind of resources in place to fight COVID-19 forever. You know, you, you, you strike so many incredible chords uh, for me, and I know for anyone watching this video who's investigating what we're up to and uh, wanting to learn more about who you are or just simply wanting to learn more about where we're at at this particular juncture in our, our history as a mankind. Um, but what's interesting is, is that you, you strike a really important point uh, among many. But the one that we may be able to close off on is this, is that as we see, for example, professional sports really struggling to figure out how they can, in fact, resume a season, uh, start a season, uh, get back to race circuits and, and playoff seasons and the like, uh, their biggest challenge, too, is not just getting their athletes back on the floor into training on the rink uh, and or in a ring, but more important, the fans. And uh, again, it doesn't sound like social distancing is just going to be a, a long forgotten me measurement uh, of, of being able to contain the issue. It's, it sounds like it's a big part of the new norm. So to your point about saying, hey, I, I tested this morning, I'm fine. Uh, here's my badge of cl a clean bill of health. I'm, I'm good. It sounds like there's a real shift in the way that people relate to one another uh, and the way we're actually profiling ourselves and interacting with one another. What, what would be the big advice that you'd want to give people so they can get ahead of the curve, get prepared uh, for all of these insights uh, and predictions that you've shared so far? Well, the first thing they should do is follow the advice of their public health leaders in, in the country, self-isolate, let's dampen the curve so we can sustain the health system so that it will be there for the future of COVID-19 as we work our way through it to find better treatments and ultimately get a vaccine that will eradicate COVID-19 uh, on the planet is our hope. In the meantime, I believe that every family member has to take a look at how, how what, what, what do I need to do in order to reintegrate into society? What should I prepare for? And I think people will have to, um, to make hard decisions on, on who goes first back into the economy. And it's about uh, looking out for one another as we, it, it's gonna be a, a greater collective than we've ever seen in our entire life to move forward. Yeah, I've got, I've got my own term where my family has designated me as the designated expendable. So whoever's gonna <laughs> have to go back, whoever's gotta go back to work, it'll be, it'll be me. And, uh, but, but I mean, with all kidding aside, I know that there'll be precautions that I'll take. I know that there's gonna be uh, latex glove wearing and, and new masks that I'll always have to not recycle, but replace. I know that face shields will become a part of the norm, uh, especially during the real high contagion season uh, and tests, home tests that I should be able to readily have available. So I know that with some accuracy, I can, I can test this up if I'm suspect, suspecting if I'm carrying something uh, or, or simply just to be able to be allowed back at the office uh, or into a game or are back into a large setting. So uh, there's certainly, these are new times and uh, we're grateful for you, Michael, for not only the work that you've done and the leadership that you've uh, uh, been able to really gift uh, our society with, with your, with your thought leadership, uh, but on behalf of QuestCap, thank you so much for being uh, an advisor to who they are, but also a stand for what they want to resolve. Uh, it goes without saying that I think that uh, all of mankind and everyone that's watching is grateful for you. Thank you, Rich. That's uh, much appreciated. I, I'm a family man and my wife works frontline. I want her to come home healthy every night from working as a nurse and everything that you said about uh, protecting yourself and your family. 
that's why I do what I do because uh, you just uh, want to protect your family and and um, that's what I think uh, Quest Cap ultimately is about is is helping society and moving forward to uh, help us continue to protect the ones we love. That's it. Quest Cap stands for the betterment of mankind, not just for today, but for hundreds of generations to come. Folks, uh, what a what a real treat to be sitting here with uh, Michael McCarthy uh, on behalf of Quest Cap. Michael, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And uh, thank you to you for watching today. My name is Richard Dolan. It's been a real treat to sit with you. And until next time, Quest Cap and MedQuest TV will return. Thanks, everyone.